When Jesus came to earth, uh, his goal, his number one goal, was simply to do the will of the Father. The Bible says in John chapter 9, verse 4, Jesus talking, I must do the work of, uh, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh with no man can work. So Jesus' goal when he came to here on earth was simply to do his Father's will. Okay? The most important work that Jesus was going to accomplish, the most important work that any man has ever accomplished in the history of human history of the world, was what he was going to do on Calvary by giving his life uh, to, as a redeeming of uh, redemption for us, fulfilling salvation's plan. Okay, that was the greatest work that he was going to do. That was the greatest work that anyone has ever done here on earth is what the work that Jesus did on Calvary. The Bible says in John 3, 17, For God hath sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Uh, John nineteen thirty, When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, this is talking about uh, when he was on the cross, he was about to give up the ghost, he was about to, to give his life for everyone that ever had lived, everyone that was currently living, and everyone that was going to be living, you and I. Uh, he said, it is finished. He bowed his head and gave up the ghost. But much of Jesus' earthly ministry involved people. Okay, We know that the most important thing that he was going to do was Calvary. But apart from that, uh, his earthly ministry involved people. I've heard uh, people say in a joking manner, uh, the ministry would be a very easy place to work if it wasn't for all the people. And uh, the, the ministry is people, okay? So uh, there would be no ministry without people. And much of Jesus, what he did on earth, really all of Jesus that he did on earth that had anything of importance was with people. He sought after people for salvation. Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. He... Uh, uh, thank you. I think this is this from you, Brother Ken. Thank you for the tea. Appreciate it. And Jesus sought after them for salvation. Uh, Jesus taught them. Uh, John seven fourteen. Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. Jesus taught. Uh, Jesus, he, uh, he fed. Uh, he healed. Uh, he raised uh, folks from the dead. And we could talk uh, for hours about all of the things that Jesus did for people. Uh, John 6, 1, after these things, Jesus went over to the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him because they saw the miracles which he did on them that were diseased. Jesus was in the business of saving people. That's the most important business that Jesus has done, did, or will ever do, is saving people. But Jesus also was in the business of teaching people. And we see how uh, the impact that Jesus had when he left, not only did he reach people and save people and bring people to himself, but he also, he left a legacy behind him, right? The, the disciples. And he taught them how to do exactly what he had done. And I think that any of us uh, that are doing the Christian life, we ought not to be doing it without some uh, prodigies underneath us, following along with us, learning. And I also want to encourage you, Jesus uh, wasn't a uh, bat in a thousand. Uh, with his disciples. One of his disciples was the very one that betrayed him uh, with a kiss and uh, killed himself. Someone's locked out, I think. Um, <clears throat> Jesus was a teacher, and he taught others how to do what he wanted them to do. He didn't say, well, you should have learned by watching me. Figure it out, guys. He taught him, and he took time and was very careful to teach. But what, I'm gonna what we're going to talk about this morning is uh, another thing that Jesus did while he was here on house, and that was he was not only in the business of saving people, he was not only in the business of teaching people, but he was in the business of helping people. And as we continue in this, whatever you want to call it, journey or uh, of this refocusing that we've been, we've been doing at church here for this last year, we are going to be bringing in people who need help. And there's those of us who are currently here at church that need help. Uh, if you ever uh, spent much time with me, do I need help. Uh, but we're going to bring in people, in all seriousness, who need help. Uh, people, and we'll get into it in a moment, but they have been, um, they've been dealing with the consequences of sin. And uh, we need to be able to help them, all right? Uh, well, so let's get, that's the, that is the message today. I want to give you four tools, the four T's of how to help people. 
Not just like, oh, here, let me give you a, a few bucks to get a meal. I'm talking about a real deal, get to the root of the problem. Uh, what, what the root, why are all of these superficial um, issues happening? What's the real, how do you get down to that root problem and figure out, oh, that's why this lady or this man who's 50, 60 years old is living their life like this because something happened to them when they were six. Okay, I'm talking about that kind of helping people. I'm going to give you the four T's of helping people. We mentioned just a moment ago, there are so many people that are hurting and they are dealing with and suffering the consequences of sin. So many people get angry at God and they think that all these terrible things that are happening to people are because God is a monster and he wants to watch the suffering of people. That's not the case. And most of the time, people are, are, are suffering um, financially or uh, physically or spiritually, mentally, any leaves that you can come up with because they're you're just simply suffering the consequences of sin. And uh, whether these people are often they're dealing with direct consequences of sin, meaning they are the ones who chose to do the sinning. Uh, they're dealing with uh, the sins of maybe being an alcoholic and, and all the things that come along with alcoholism. Maybe they're dealing uh, with a life of drug abuse and just all the things that come along with that from a mental standpoint and all the fallout from being a, a drug addict. Maybe there's people who are dealing with a, a life of, of uh, a gambling addiction and the financial distress and all the family that, that falls away because of that stronghold. The people who are dealing with the, and living a life uh, dealing with consequences from being uh, from unfaithfulness from one or the other either they're they they were unfaithful Or their spouse was unfaithful to them and then the things the fallout from that There's also people who are dealing with consequences of sin from an indirect Way they weren't the one who chose to do the sinning But they were sinned against and that or their or their parents or someone in their life sinned and that directly is affecting them uh, I think of uh, maybe substance abuse in the wound womb. Um, our son would deal with some of that throughout his life. Um, not, not anything that he did. Not, not Duke Tucker. Uh, <laughs> no choice of his own, but something that he'll deal with for the rest of his life. Uh, those who lived in a divorced home, those kids had no uh, choice uh, whether their parents stayed together or, or were divorced, but yet they lived the consequence of someone else's sin. Um, people who were either sexually, physically, or verbally abused throughout their life. I have uh, gotten to know uh, and um, people who have had who have suffered all of those different type of abuses. And I would say this, uh, though, people who have been sexually abused in their lives have a very heavy load to deal with and a tough road to hoe if you would going forward in their lives people who have been physically abused and verbally abused have the same psychological sometimes verbal abuse can be more difficult uh, to to overcome because often verbal abuse is something that's never dealt with it's never stopped most sometimes people never see it it's never identified and it's just psychologically damaging and no one would ever look at uh, a man or a woman and say, well, that, you know, that's a psycho. He needs to be in jail uh, because he was, you know, touching the, a, a, young, a young person. Well, with the, with the words, those things are just as hurtful, just as damaging, but there's no law or, or any punishment levied for those kinds of things. So they're dealing with people that are just dealing with all of these different things. And we could talk for hours about the consequences that people are dealing with, but they need help. And if we're going to help them, the only thing that we're going to be able to do for them that's going to help them is to show them the love of Jesus. But I want to show you in a, and, and I could just preach the message and end that there. Let's show them the love of Christ. Well, what does that look like? How are we supposed to do that? And what do we do when the help uh, that they need goes beyond just, well, read the Bible verses and claim the promises. Those are important things, but sometimes help is needed beyond read the Bible verses and claim the promises. All right? So this message, we're going to look at four ways we can help others gain the victory over their troubles. Number one, time. Number one, time. One of the qualities that set Jesus apart from any other uh, person and, and at times confounded people was his willingness to spend time with them. 
Think of, we're, at, we're there now, John chapter 4, verse 9. This is the, the story of the woman at the well. Then says the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus did not allow age to dictate who he was going to spend time with. Jesus said, suffer the children. He didn't say, well, them snot-nosed kids, they don't know. Jesus never said that. Jesus did not allow race, as we see in this story here, to determine who he was going to spend time with. I love uh, what Billy Graham said in a message, and he said it often. He said, the, the gospel is not a white man's truth. It's not a black man's faith. It's a world faith. It's for everybody. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. It doesn't matter the color, the nationality, how you grew up, where you grew up. It's for everybody. Jesus didn't allow social standing or uh, any other factor to determine whether he would spend time with that person. I think if Jesus were here on earth, uh, he would, I would, say, would say, oh, wouldn't it be awesome to spend time with Jesus? I think many of us in our schedule orientedness would be very frustrated with Jesus because say, Jesus, it's 11 o'clock. Time to start service. And Jesus would be in the back uh, talking with someone. And you say, uh, Jesus, uh, time, well, let's just start the choir without him. And then and he's supposed to speak, uh, and we'll give him some time. And because Jesus didn't, Jesus had, Jesus was worried about what was the most important. I don't think we should just throw a schedule out the window. It's important. But Jesus was worried about spending time with people. And he knew the number one thing that those people needed was to spend time with him. And Jesus isn't here on earth in a physical, tangible way today, but he is here vicariously through us. And the way that G other people can spend time with Jesus is when you're living right and spending time with them through you, through the Holy Spirit. It's important that we spend time with people. If we're going to help people, we're going to have to spend time with them. Time is a precious commodity. Apart from the gospel, time is arguably the, arguably the most important thing that you can give to anyone. It's important to spend time with your family, with your spouse, with your children, with your neighbors, with your brothers and sisters in Christ, and especially those that we're trying to help. This is a poem entitled, Little Time. She climbed, she climbed up in my lap today just to be held. That's it. She didn't want to sing or play, just fill my arms and sit. She climbed up in my lap today with a blanket and a smile. She didn't need that much from me, just a little while. She climbed up in my lap today to remind me she is mine, and despite all the things I give her, all she really wants is time. If we're going to help people, number one, we have to give people time, and we're going to see how that is a very important part. Number two, we have to, we have to is trust. I told you I'd give you the four T's, time and then trust. As you spend time with people, you are going to gain their trust. You cannot help someone with the deeper issues. We can help them with superficial things that they share. We can't help them with the deeper issues if they don't trust you. Jesus, uh, if we can trust, we trust Jesus with our eternal destination. Why? Because we trust him. We put our faith and trust in Jesus. We say, Jesus, you take care of heaven for me. I, I trust you. And if we are going to help others, it's going to be because they trust us for that help. Well, you may ask, well, how do I gain someone else's trust? There is probably no more important factor in gaining someone's trust than spending time with them. As you spend time with those who you're trying to help, as they see your faithfulness, as they see your testimony lived out in a tangible way, as they see that you're trustworthy, you'll gain their trust. Number three, time, trust, truth. As we spend time with people, we gain their trust. As we gain their trust, they will share with us the truth. The truth about what is truly troubling them. The truth about what they really feel and why. And the truth about their deep-rooted insecurities, fears, problems, etc., etc. Once we know the truth, the Lord will help with the Lord's help. We will be able to begin giving them help. How do we help people? By spending time with them. As we spend time, we, we gain their trust. As we gain their trust, they'll tell us the truth. And when they tell us the truth, we're able to help them with their trouble. 
Let me give you an illustration. Um, I, I, I truly just made up an illustration. There's no one in mind. This is not, oh, this is somebody, and, and I'm, we're just going to keep her un, unnamed. This is just a random uh, illustration, and uh, try to keep it appropriate, and but hopefully helpful, and we'll, we'll convey how this works, okay? There's a, an, an adult lady at church. We'll say she's 35 years old, and she's having trouble at home. She's having trouble with her husband. She's having trouble at work with her boss and with relationships at work. She's having trouble at church. Uh, she has issues with the pastor. She has issues with the deacons. We'll also say that this lady, uh, she was verbally abused as, uh, by her father as a child, okay? Uh, just simply just berated and, you know. The problem is not her husband, although that may be a result of those things. And that may not be that she has, uh, that she hates him or that he's the problem. It may not be the problem is the boss. The problem is not the pastor, the deacons, or God, but the problem is a, a, maybe a deep-rooted bitterness towards her father. Maybe a deep-rooted uh, mistrust in men or people in general. The problem are wounds that have never had time to heal or never had the opportunity to heal. Maybe it's still ongoing as as we speak. But that issue is that's been there for years and years and years is spilling over in, and affecting all other aspects of this young lady's life. And she is not going to share that deep-rooted issue with someone who she doesn't trust. She's, she may share some things. She may trust someone enough uh, or may even just or may even just see the reaction of somebody, say, uh, hey, what, I just noticed you've been really struggling. What's the matter? She may say, well, I just, I don't trust my husband. And she'll just see how you react to that. She'll just say, I'm thinking about leaving him. But she'll just see how you react to that. And if you fly off the handle and you tell her how terrible she is or, or how that she ought not to believe that way and how could she believe that, she's never going to tell you the actual problem, what the root is. But as someone spends time with that young lady and invests in her, and not in a, in a oh, we're going to try to fix her every time we're with her, just spend time. This may take years. We're talking about this may take 10 years. Just spend time. Have games. Love on her. In, invite her into church. Take her as she is. Eventually, that time is going to relate to trust. That trust is going to eventually relate to where she's willing to share the truth. Then once we know the truth, we can, we can address the actual trouble that she's having. Say, okay, now I see that. Someone who has an improper view of their father has an improper view of God. Someone who has an improper view of God is going to be very stunted in their spiritual growth. And we can, and we can help, not the byproducts, not the work situation, not the husband, not the pastor, not the tiffs with the deacons. We can help the root problem. And also other, other peripherals will take care of themselves. And usually with the trouble, usually with the root problem, there also is accompanied by a lie from the devil. Usually the devil is always going to see that opportunity and he's going to, the devil, the devil is slippery and slimy. That's why he came as a snake. And he came to Eve and he, he, he put a lie in there. And with that, whatever it is, root trouble, he's going to slip a lie in there. That may be... Um, for a man, your, your, your wife was unfaithful to you. The devil's going to say, all women are unfaithful. You can't trust any women. That's where a lot of times, be, like guys who snap and become serial killers or whatever, because they just have a deep-rooted hate towards their mother or someone who was unfaithful to them. That's a lie. That The devil saw an opportunity and slipped it in there and made it a stronghold. Maybe someone whose father was verbally abusive to him. And maybe a young lady say, all men are pigs. They're not ever listening to a man. Well, they're never going to be able to listen to the preaching from a man of God. They're going to listen to uh, someone who tries to help them. Maybe uh, someone who was uh, 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 raped or taking, taken advantage of as a young person. They say, well, it was my fault. If I wasn't around, it wouldn't have happened. If I wouldn't have been wearing that or doing that, it wouldn't have sparked that thought, and so-and-so told me it was my fault. 
It's a lie from the devil. It's not, it's not their fault. Maybe someone whose family member passes away. Well, God took them from you. You did something and God retaliated and took those people from you. Talk about a warped sense of God. Maybe a, a child passes away. Those are all lies that the devil will get us to believe when we're in a vulnerable position. The devil has no rules. The devil has no morals. He is just going to come at you when you're at your absolute lowest and he's just going to bury on you with the most slippery, nasty lies that he can get, give you, get you to believe. And the sad part is, generally, we're going to believe them. But when we spend time with people, we can gain their trust. When they trust us, they'll tell us the truth. When we understand the truth, we can understand the trouble. We can help them with the trouble. We can help them overcome the lies that Satan has ingrained into their psyche. And we can make them useful for God again. So I want to encourage you. What is the, what is the conclusion of this message? I want you to be encouraged that there are a lot of people that the Lord is going to bring to us who need help. There's a reason why they look, smell, talk, think the way that they do. It's not because they're terrible people. It's because they need help. And in a, a lot of times, church is the last place they're coming. If they, don't, if they come here and it doesn't work out, they're done. They're going to be helpless. Are we willing to help them? Are we willing to invest time in them? so that they can trust us, so that we can understand the truth, so that we can help them with their trouble and debunk the lies that Satan feeds to them. How can we help people? Time, trust, truth, and trouble.